Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are prof- prof- <laughs> professional illustrators. <laughs> We've all worked with all the major publishers in the business. Together, we publish somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. That is correct. Uh, each week, month, day, how long? When, I don't know how, we how whenever we whenever we record, we uh, answer your questions about illustration and the field of illustration and business and all that stuff as best we can. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you learn something brand spanking new. All right. So I our uh, icebreaker question today is: What was the last movie you saw? And uh, I'm going through the chat here. We have. Uh, Friend of mine's Sarah says friend of mine's doing a Star Wars marathon, so a, a slow Star Wars marathon. So I assume that's like you watch one movie a night or one movie each weekend or something like that. I don't know, but it's Attack of the Clones is the last one. We've got Knock at the Cabin. We've got a couple Avatar twos. Mm. Uh, Martha pulling out an old '90s movie, Grumpy Old Men, with uh, I don't even know that one <laughs> with Walter Walter Matthau. Uh, and then we got Sea Beast. Did you guys ever see Sea Beast? Never no. heard of that one either. It was a Netflix animated show last year, not a show, like a, a movie. It's actually pretty, pretty cool. It's about um, it was kind of like how to train your dragon, but sea monsters. Hmm. I feel like movies the right for the regular movies that we're watching lately, that we're on a little bit of a, a down cycle that they just seem kind of lame. Like I haven't seen anything recently. I haven't seen Avatar 2. So that's, I'm, I'm holding out hope to say. that. <laughs> but, uh, but everything else just seems sort of bland. And and I, I'm just not seeing anything that interesting lately. Did you see Maverick? I did. I liked that one. That um, was, what was cool about that one was it was an 80s movie, but done with contemporary like sensibilities and special effects and cinematography and all yeah. that. It was nice. like the structure of an 80s movie. But do you know that the real Top Gun they're saying is this uh, devotion movie? Did you know that? No. Being billed as the real Top Gun. Because it's a, based on, a, it's, yeah, it's a based on a true story. It's not the last movie I saw. I saw Avatar 2, but that was the one before that. And it's, Did you uh, like Avatar 2? Well, I did. A lot. Oh. I I turned off my political side of my brain that doesn't like parts of it, and <laughs> um. But yeah, no the the devotion movie. Jonathan Majors was a really good actor, Glenn Powell, and um. Yeah, it's really good. You should watch it. It's a tr- based on a true story. That's cool. I think Maverick is more entertaining for sure. Yeah, it's it's divorced of a lot of reality because it had to be. Mm-hmm. Like today, we don't get into um, aerial combat, one on one aerial combat. That just doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know, man. We shot down that balloon. Yeah. The first air to air kill for an F 22 was shooting down a Chinese balloon. So, because <laughs> <laughs> you can't really hang a, a blockbuster movie on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, they had to come up with this wild, like, scenario where there's uh you know a a facility that needs to be destroyed in the middle of a of a canyon through a winding canyon that you have to get there and you can only go in the canyon you can't go above it because of missiles it's like really fabricated it's a lot of fun but it's like it's as more in common with like gi joe cartoon Mm. than it does with i think realistic uh Mm. um yeah you know tactical airfare or airfare <laughs> tactical air, airfare air warfare the southwest is doing no tactical air combat that's what we'll, we'll call it all right let's do, uh, okay, let's do so, this yeah well, well we while we're questions. on the movie topic Be- beatrice says uh she saw pinocchio by guillermo 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 del toro there you go. We we um, can't answer questions if we don't have any, so we're going to keep I, talking about movies. I well, tell you, if you want to compare punishment. and contrast, no. I know Will Will didn't love that Pinocchio, so let's just. I love the visuals, that. and I loved so much about it. I just felt like 
I can't really go into why because it would it would take me into re- religion, but um, I just I just didn't like the overall messaging from that. It was that like, yeah, part of it. but did you see did you see the politics, other politics um, religion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did uh, did you did you see the other Pinocchio with Tom Hanks? Uh uh-uh. uh I saw oh, like the first thirty disaster. minutes of both of them. Oh. What did you think about Jake about Del Toro's? So the Del Toro one, uh, I got about 30 minutes into it and I just haven't returned to it yet. Oh, um, but the first 30 minutes were beautiful, but kind of boring. I didn't have uh, enough patience to like get through it. And, and I also have this problem where I fall asleep during stop motion films. Oh, really? And, and I don't know what it is, but they always put me to sleep. I don't know if it's like the frame rate type of thing. It's the flashing that, that they always worry that they always warning you know, you're going to have a seizure, but you don't. You just you do the opposite. No, you, just, you need to sleep. you need to get on the stairmaster or the uh, the the treadmill or something while you're watching it. Just walk. Yeah, along. yeah, that, that'll probably do it. So, but I don't want to fall asleep on a treadmill. That could be disastrous. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if it's that, or if I don't know if all stop motion film have like pacing issues that's have you air. seen have you seen the fantastic mr fox that is an exception i love that movie okay well yeah. then that's then it's not that because it's stop motion but it, it's a, i love that one too all right yeah. sarah has a question let's dive in and argue about it let's do um, it <laughs> <laughs> she says uh she's wanting to know if she's in the ballpark she's starting to receive work from clients several clients that are coloring book style they're black and white inked digitally of course uh for one client these these take uh, around 14 to 15 hours to do uh, um let me ask you sarah before we dive too far into it is it 14 to 15 hours total starting with concept and getting approval and then doing the finish or is it 14 to 15 hours on just the final and if that's the case tell me how long each one's taking for the actual whole illustration um she's currently making about 400 dollars on each one of those which is double what she got when she started right out of college but still might be too low given the speed okay so a couple things there i uh, can start off with right off the bat it does not matter how fast or slow you are that does not change the client's rate right um for you um because uh, you know it it if I'm faster, should they pay me more? And somebody slower, they pay them less. It's just based on, did you do the job? So maybe you need to get faster, um, but it doesn't, it, it don't you could equate value with the speed. Um, mm-hmm. 400 bucks an image. Um, that's, I mean, it's a black and white coloring book style. So no value for the most part. Uh, and if there's, I guess how many of them, are there if you're breaking them down like that if you got faster and you could do one per day that's mm-hmm. a pretty good it's a pretty good week yeah so that's my yeah. my bigger question is not are they paying enough it's can you speed up that's a better question mm. um yeah, well, a lot of people get hung up on the the idea that because i work because it took me so long yeah you should pay me more and i just like to remind people that i have a I have a friend who think he thinks he, the same thing about um, any work, right? He's mm-hmm. not an illustrator, but you know, and he won't answer this question, by the way. So he's like, if a guy hand digs a swimming pool, he should be paid with a shovel. Yeah, with a shovel. He should be paid per hour, no matter how long it takes. Like that's his hard work. That's his labor, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, then I'll say, well, but what if I rent a backhoe and do it in an hour? Should I be paid less than you? And he's like, yeah, you should. I'm like, well, what if you ch- showed up to work with a spoon? And yeah. you decided that you were going to take a week hole with that spoon. <laughs> should you should the same person pay you 10 times as much because it took you 10 times as long? And he's like, that's ridiculous. I'm like, it is but you you have to go to the ridiculous you have to go to the ridiculous sometimes to break an idea right 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 i think yeah so so the 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 other thing is it's coloring books is what she's designing and some coloring book pages are really ornate like they've got a ton of detail on them so that people can go in and like Mm. color in and you know it's a meditative thing and so um and so 
uh, uh, they they really do want them to be like highly detailed. So I would say uh, this might be a conversation you have with the publisher and just say, look, this amount of detail, I'm actually going to have to charge you 800 bucks per page. And this right. amount of detail is a $400 page because I'm dying here. I'm, I can barely afford to make these. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good, honest conversation. If they're like, sorry, our budget is 400 a page. Then you say, well, you either decide if you really love doing these and you want to keep it or just go for look, go look for uh, better paying work. Cause mm -hmm. like, well, or, or figure out how to simplify them so you can speed them up. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one thing I've been doing, you saw my, my kid was back here working. He's actually working for me and I have a job that I'm on right now where I'm designing, doing designs. And then I hand them the line drawings and I've already trained them how to just put on simple, uh, like two tone color, light and shadow. And, and we've cranked out, you know, 50 of these so far, um, with just me finishing them, handing to him, he colors them. I get them back. I fix a little, a few things. He works for 20 bucks an hour plus room and board. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> and so it, i'm able to um spend a, probably a, a full day of work working on something else because he's he's doing all that for me so mm -hmm. you might find somebody who's like willing to work for 15 dollars an hour to like fill in you know if it's detailed that it just needs to be detailed you could just rough in like uh i'm gonna need bubbles here and here's like bubbles and then hand it to them and they'll just ink in the bubbles for you uh, digitally. And then, and then, um, but the whole concept and the whole idea is yours. So now you're getting. Right. So she, so she sort of maps it out and then yeah. hands it to the assistant. Oh, that's yeah. good. That's good stuff. Right like there. you just, maybe, you, you know, the real expertise is, is faces. So you do the faces and then hand like the flowers over to your assistant and, mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and then it becomes a, a, a better, you know, more, a better thing for you to do. That's a, just another way to look at it, but start to finish 14 to 15 hours for a single coloring page. Yeah, it, it should be, you should be asking a little bit more for that or doing it a little bit faster. Yeah. I'd say, I'd, I mean, at least go up to 500 bucks, but then also see if you can speed up and that way you get, you know, the win on both sides of those, mm -hmm. that equation. I also, there's another thing about this too, like um, in my work of doing concept art, um, if you get a job for TV, they pay half of what feature pays, feature animation. So, um, but there's consistently more work in TV. So you can like, you know, you can always count on there being another job at the end of that job and feature it's like we need you for you know a couple months and then they move on um so oftentimes what you know my strategy is is look for the most amount of feature work i could do because the roi is like so much higher i i spend the same amount of time but i'm getting double the pay and mm -hmm. so um so you just might want to look and see what you know, what's worth it? Is it worth it to work for this company at a little bit cheaper pay, but you know, you're going to have a job with them for six months or, you know, look for something that's higher pay, but you're not, you're not sure. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of ways to like figure this one out. Man, one I, think more little... I think you're right in that. If, if you take the time to explain to your client and say, look, I, I, I don't know how you exactly say this, but if, if you can communicate that you know that that they have a budget, but you also have like, you know, time that you're trying to make things work. I don't know, just having that conversation about money and time and, and you know. The other thing, when we always come back to this too, which we haven't talked about yet, is what's stopping you from being the publisher of a coloring book, you know? Right. Like, oh, like, I like that. You got to get go your distribution your own, figured out. Yeah. yeah. But, but you know, great... figure out the business side of it a little bit, make your own coloring book. And what's, well, it's interesting that you bring that up because right now 
I've started on this pickleball book and I'm, I figure I'm about, I'm probably about 14 to $15,000 in the hole. And I haven't hired another um, artist. I mean, I hired a designer that mm-hmm. that's part of that money that I paid out. And, um, but like, if I were looking to hire an illustrator as a client now to help me with it, which I've thought about doing, um, you know, all of a sudden I have to be really careful and offer as little as I possibly can in order to still attract someone to, to get them to say yes. Right. I mean, that's really what it is. It's push pull, right? It's, it's, it's force downward force and upward force. You're the upward force as the illustrator trying to get more money. They're the downward force going. I don't want to, I don't want to go out of business. I don't want to lose um, in this project, you know, and some projects lose money. And, and, you know, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a bigger publisher, even, even mid-sized publishers, or small publishers who, that that might have a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe they have um, a nest egg of half a million dollars or something. They still don't want to lose that. They don't want to lose their capital. They don't want to, you know, they want every every investment they make in a project to bear fruit. They know that a lot of them don't, and that's another reason why they offer so little. Is sometimes the ones that do make money have to make up for the ones that lost money. I think in publishing, it's like, isn't it like the ratio is like eight to one? Mm-hmm. Eight, uh, one out of eight books actually makes a profit yeah. and seven lose money. Yeah, now, the ones true. that make a profit, I mean, they make New York Times bestseller lists. Some, some, I, I, I heard one time that um, the pokey little puppy was the, the highest grossing book of all time <laughs> at, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to. I think it was something like five over billion. 100 million. No, I think it was over 100 million. But I know that Eric Eric Carl's um, Hungry Little Caterpillar was like, I think that was like over 40 million. Well, uh, I mean, gross. the caterpillar thing is like it's it's its own industry in that right. you can get the stuffed animals. And right. It's well, and now it's that, that that's probably really old news. Um, so they have a they have a franchise like like let's say the uh um what's the pig books those um Peppa pig no the olivia olivia um you have all these different Food and puddles <laughs> yeah you have all these series of, of books that have done really well and those are what that's basically what the publisher is is those those franchises and then and then you have like all the books they're trying to get to that level that mm-hmm. they lose money and on. And they never knew it. They never know which one's going to be. Right. You know? So they just got to put them all out there. Right. We're drifting so a little bit. Let's get back to, let's get back to. to well, but I, I think it's, yeah, we, we can, but I mean, I think it's interesting to, as the illustrator, to kind of have a little sympathy for the client going, you know, they're trying to, they're, one of the reasons why they offer so little is they're afraid of going bankrupt. I mean, they're afraid. But of if, going. but if she's, she said she's been working for these clients for four or five years and if they're doing multiple books, that must mean they're doing well because they're not gonna, just going to keep dumping money. Like, I hope one of these hits, these well, coloring right. books, because they're part of the series now. So I've got two suggestions for her right now. Um, one of them is, you know, we were talking a little bit about techniques to speed up your process by hiring an assistant, uh, uh, you know, figuring out some of that stuff. And I just want to add to that little um, group of tricks and techniques is think about your repetitive items and make the computer is so good at making things that are repetitive. And so making like, I've got a couple of pattern, like I've got a uh, brick wall pattern brush. I've got a roof tile brush. I've got a, I've got even a couple of forest brushes with one tree, Mm -hmm. three trees, seven trees. And I can pepper those around and then custom draw like four trees in a forest instead of 25 trees. And Mm -hmm. man, it speeds. I mean, even stuff, it's just sort of a layering process to build up an image. And if you can somehow have, have like Will tear Will Will has a uh, a cr- sort of a crosshatch pencil br- brush that he uses to speed up the shading that he was showing Actually, and I. Can I show you a really cool trick on Photoshop right now? Boom! Unexpected Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Here we go. And then uh, read that question from or I mean, we'll, we'll maybe this goes along with it. Beatrice Baghulo says, "How do I raise my rates? I've been working with client." 
So okay, you want so to talk about that too. Yes. So go ahead and open your Photoshop, start doing that. Let me talk about that. Um, that's a good one. That is a question that everyone has, and including us, we just had to raise our rates at SVS. We're paying more people. Everything costs more. Now think about what rates were five years ago. Oh my gosh. I mean, everything has you know quadrupled in price. There's almost no way if you're working at the same rate now that you were at five years ago, that that's going to be profitable. And any person who's goes to the grocery store <laughs> at any point in time would understand it. If you said, Hey, this is my rate from 2018, 2019, um, my current normal right here. So here's how you phrase it to your client. My going rate now is $800 a page, but since we've worked together so much, uh, I'm going to give you, uh, uh, I need to go to $600 per page on the next book. Um, and just leave it at that. You don't have to over explain. You don't have to try to grovel and make, make it make sense. Just say, Hey, my rates are going to this much. And, uh, but I'm going to give you this discount because you've been with me for so long and make it feel like a win for them. What do you think about that? Will? Sorry. I was looking at the next question. Uh, I was, for, I knew I was, he was actually drifting. formulating for uh, Kristen. Um, I knew he was drifting. I caught him, I I caught him dozing had, in there. I figured you had this. Lee. <laughs> anyway, that's how, that's how I got to, I've had to raise my prices. Everybody has had to raise their prices and, uh, and that's how you do it. And every business has to deal with it. So, I mean, it's weird because a lot of times artists have this guilt about making money and we have to get over that. We are a business just like any other business. So like I bought a burrito for $18. That is enough for me to raise my rates right there. I need, I'm going to make it a burrito charge uh, to my you know clients. How many times we've heard about this burrito since we bought it? <laughs> no, it, it, it just, it, it was, it was the line in the sand. You know, you, you sort of kind of sense the price is rising. And then I got hit with the $18 burrito. That was the line in the sand for me where I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I can't afford to eat a burrito. I can't, I need to raise my rates. Um, <laughs> Every, if everybody else can raise their rates, why can't we? Is my right. end end of that. So what I'm what I'm showing here is you have this this really complex hair, right? And now I'm going to have to go in here and just kind of erase out some of these parts and make sure it's like going over. And and this is something that you know you you might be doing with a with a with a coloring page or with anything that has a lot of details, like figuring out how to make these all this detail and spend all this time like trying to go in here and just making sure that everything looks good but it's still kind of crappy i'm going to show you a fast and easy way to do hair so i'm going to do a new layer i'm going to come down here to uh effects and just do um outer glow where'd oh, you no, get stroke. the effects from what's that where you it's, went it's down there it's down there in the layer palette yeah. It just says FX down there. FX here. right there. We're going to switch this to black because that's what we're working in. And yeah, we're going to do, we'll just say a, a five pixel. No, we'll do a, a seven pixel line on the outside. I'm going to switch. It's black right there. I'm going to switch it to white. Oops. Push the wrong button. Get back to brush. Okay. So now we're white. Now I'm going to go in here and do the hair like this. Hold on. Okay, we're just going to build... Whoops, wrong button. Well, that's interesting how it got rid of the line as you crossed over. Okay, so now we're going to go in here. Oh, interesting. Hair, hair helmet going on. Yeah. Dude, I don't know what kind of sorcery you're doing right now. What's happening? How is that not leaving the first line? Oh, no, I understand it. I understand. Okay. That's So trippy. you could go in there and you could just add as much little detail and it's like outlining it for you right it all and then once that's done you go over the top you don't have um you know you don't have the effects layer added to that anymore and you can go in here and just like fix some of this stuff and bring these lines in the way you you want them to be this is like <laughs> really bad but you, you get what i'm saying right and maybe you know some of these you want to to go over and and under and hey, that's Jake? just like a really can you just get mid journey to do this for you <laughs> <laughs> hey Jake, we have a how to draw hair class. You might want to check that out. That's true. 
<laughs> but I'm just saying, this is like if you're doing, um, if you're doing what's it called, uh, line drawing, like yeah. really detailed line drawing. This is, I've never seen no, that. That's, that's pretty cool. That's great. I like that. You'd have to play with it for a while to get really familiar with getting. Yeah, the but the, you you, I just showed you the basic principle there. Then it's yeah. up to you to noodle it, you know, yeah. to where you need it to be. Um, so there's a question there that I saw. Is there a question that we patrons never ask, which you wish we did? I'll tell you there's a question I wish you stopped asking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I, don't, I actually don't mind getting this question all the time, but this is the number one question I feel like we've gotten in the four years that we've done this. And that's how do I get an agent? It's It's like, uh, um, it's just this constant, constant, question that's on on people's minds and the answer to that question is sort of the same as how do i get a publisher it's not different if you're good enough to get an agent you're good enough to get a publisher but going mm -hmm. the agent route is going to be a, a better way to go uh, yeah. but your, your work has, has to be really really good by the way let me just add to that if you don't know how your work is you know what skill level you're at and what what's going on we are we have finally gotten our critiques uh ironed out and they are coming to you guys uh on let's see uh march march 1st those are to patrons launch. or to subscribers um it's going to be to subscribers i'm assuming that all our patrons are also subscribers <laughs> if you're not you got to be a subscriber um, but we are doing portfolio reviews we have six teachers enrolled and then uh i'm doing some i don't know if these guys are going to do any but we'll find out but um uh, yeah, we're, we're going to okay. take um, a X number of students and we have a rubric and a very specific breakdown for how to evaluate your artwork. Are you good enough? Where do you need to work? And filling in your portfolio. Everybody's been asking for that for a long time. And we are mm -hmm. so stoked to be able to finally yeah. enroll it. We're finally at a place where we can do that because the curriculum's complete and uh, we're ready to start adding some of these extra, extra things. Sweet. All right, so uh, I understand that we need uh, finished art on a couple of spreads and spots, but I've heard mixed feedback on how finished the drawing should be for the rest of the book, dummy. Can I, can I back up for a second? Yeah. I wanted to answer that last one. Back that thing up. <laughs> so, oh, the question that you wish you yeah. ask. Okay, yeah, I want to hear that. And that that question is, is, is how hard should I work to, um, to get this career? Mm. to get a career in illustration and my answer will be to watch a video that i'm going to post in the comments that i can't find yet and uh with a warning that there's a lot of swearing um it's basically if you can even stand to watch this interview <laughs> i think you have a chance who, who is who's, who's it's the an person? interview of david goggins who you, you guys are oh know. yeah but um <laughs> oh man the more recent one um but that you, guy. but the thing is the the short answer for me is that you you have to be willing to work harder than for almost any other career where there's a job that's given out like you know if someone goes into business management well they're going to be a manager at some some place right and there are jobs that are that are always available where they hire managers. There's I, not a really an illustrator job for us. So you have to basically you have to push other people out of of the jobs the the assignments that that would have gone to someone else. You have to you have to work yeah. hard enough to attract those and 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 hopefully get to a point where you can work on your own projects and publish your own stuff and and become like the list of this, there's a pretty big list of of artists. Well, it's it's a relatively small list, but there's a it's a growing list of people that have taken control of their careers and and are very well off because they're they they went for it and they they worked really hard. But you've got to be able to you've got to work really hard. I'll find the interview. If it's he even talks about in that interview, he even mentions the story of I can't remember the the guy who Will Smith played in the Pursuit of Happiness. Mm -hmm. it's that drastic like you have to be willing to go drastic to make it uh, i was gonna say too this has made me realize something as well that that in all my experience and seeing uh just knowing people and seeing people who have made a million dollars 
it's the same amount of, it's almost this, I feel like it's the same amount of work regardless of, of who's, who's doing, it, you know, who's, who's doing it and what career they have. So, and it, and it goes back to the same thing with uh, the, the digging the swimming pool. Like I've made, I'd say in the first 10 years of my career as an artist, I made about a million dollars. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that took me 10 years to do. And there was a lot of like freelance work, but then the day job stuff and like Kickstarters or whatever. Right. Um, but then you might look at someone who did a really, uh, you know, who started a business or something like that. And they got to a million dollars in a, in a year. Right. Um, the, they may have been able to use different tools to get them to that level in a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking just about time and effort put in, but it's like, um, they were able to figure out how to work the backhoe and also have access to a backhoe. And so there's like all these different components that lead into it. And essentially there's no easy way to do that one, you know, to reach that one certain threshold, you either need to put in a lot of time or you need to leverage a lot of unique tools and also figure out how to use them and also figure out how to access them. But there's like, unless it's like handed to you in the lottery or something like that, and you, you just get lucky. Uh, everybody I know who's who's reached that certain threshold, it's been a lot of hard work and a lot of like seeing patterns and putting together things that nobody thought to put together. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at Dan Santa, for example, he's a, he's super successful. He has been successful ever since, ever since he left school, but the amount of work that that guy does, he's still cranking. Like we were in school. Yeah. I don't, I've kind of gotten a little bit lazier. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to work like that anymore. That guy, you know, there'd be like four books a year coming out from him. I mean, he is, he's the hardest working man in illustration, in my opinion. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what it takes. I mean, he's, he's in LA, he's in a very expensive place, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of career driven people around him, but I mean, he's, I mean, you just look at that level of success and he's still cranking that hard. So. yeah, I think too, he's like, it. um, you look at his success, he's had so many at bats with all the work that he's done right. and also living, living in LA, just bumping into all the right people that, um, you're, you're, you just have a better chance at hitting a home run. The more times you like get up to, to the plate. Right. Right. I mean, there was already talk of him in call to cut circles without a specific book being mentioned. They were almost waiting for the one yeah. to come around and it's like, okay, there's one, that's the one. And the librarians are already knew him. He's got a great personality for it. He's very, uh, social and, and, and loves that crowd, you know, that literary crowd. And uh, so, you know, it's, he made it, definitely made it his own. I will say this too, though, how hard you're going to have to work is where you are on the bell-shaped curve. If you're at the front end of that curve, um, you know, where the really, 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 really small percentage of people are, but they're really good, not going to have to work as hard. If you're in the middle where most of us are, you got to bust your butt. And then if you're on the downslope, you can bust your butt (laughs) as long as you want, (laughs) and you may not be able to overcome it. And so that's why uh, I'm not trying to push the portfolio reviews, but getting honest feedback, however you can do that, um, is is imperative. Because if you don't know where you stand, you it's just funny. If you watch American Idol, for example, sometimes I, I always wonder if these are real people or not. You know, those people go on there and they think they're singing, but they're really like, it just sounds like nails on a chalkboard almost. Mm-hmm. Do they think they're good? And you know, they can't hear it. Maybe they can't hear it. And they, they do think they're good and they're not, and they need to be either told to get better or say, hey, maybe this is not for you in terms of a professional career. Keep it as a hobby. Um, I don't mind saying that to somebody. It's, it's, I don't think that's mean. I think that saves somebody a years of heartache um, if they truly don't have it where they're at now. So, but getting some honest feedback where you are in that bell-shaped curve is going to dictate how hard you have to work, but it's all going to be hard. It's just how hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we just took um, 20 minutes to answer a question no one asked. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why our meetings run so long. <laughs> um, I want to address this, this next one from, um, from Kirsten. How do you go about designing a really complex image? Um, I'm currently trying to illustrate a character stepping into a world that's populated by characters from children's literature 
definitely a tough one. There are nine characters plus trees and bushes and all that other stuff that goes into an image like that. Let me share my screen because I get this question a lot. Um, and everyone's yeah, going to run into one. it. Yeah, this is the image that I always share for this mm. uh, because this is Paul Lassane, great production designer for for movies and stuff, feature film animator, uh, concept designer. Um, and Will does this really good in his Draw 100 Things. It's exactly what Will does is you have to 50. group. Oh, is it only 50? Yeah. I put over 100 in mine. Oh, okay. Maybe that's class what called Draw 50 Things. This was what was distracting me when you were answering that other question, by the way, was I was like thinking, okay, but keep going. I, yeah. So anyway, so <laughs> so you you have to learn to group things together. There's two things you got to do. One, you got to figure out what's important. In this particular illustration, it's a background. So it's sort of... You know, the couch looks like maybe it's going to be where our main character is going to walk in and sit or something like that. So it's may, I'll call that the subject matter, but you have to know what's important and what's not important in a scene like you're talking about. Um, the character is going to be important, but all the background characters can't have the same weight as that main character. And, uh, and they can't even have the same weight as each other, you know, so there's going to be like, maybe, maybe your character's walking in and seeing, uh, you know, Peter Pan for the first, and that's going to be your main uh, you know, fantastic uh, character in there. And then other ones are going to fall back. So in order to make something fall back, you have to group it together and in both value and level of detail and contrast, just like uh, Paul is saying did here, you've got these patterns. If you break it down, we've got just these things are dark. You know, if you cut it out in paper, it would just be a really simple silhouette. This level is light this level's dark again, and then you have a little bit of a light layer with that window back there. Same thing in this one. You've got the foreground layers all grouped together, but there's pans and there's pots and there's beef jerky, there's Toro there. Um, you know, our, our subject matter's on that middle ground, and then he's grouping all this other stuff in the lighter background together. So value grouping, um, detail grouping, contrast grouping is a way to control all that, but you have to figure out what's important and what's not important to do that well. Can I add to that? Um, yeah. I call it the blob method. So first step number one is just draw blobs as placeholders for, you know, if say she, she might be doing that. Those are like scenes. She might be doing like, um, like a movie poster style thing where um, you can't every, every sort of image or face or character on there has to have some level of prominence. Um, and, and I've in got that a case, great example of that, Go yeah, ahead. Pull, pull it up. But what I was going to say is you just make it work as blobs first compositionally. And then it's just a matter of replacing each one of those blobs with the design of the character. So this will be a tree. This is going to be, you know, a, a raccoon. This is going to be a bench. And, uh, but, it, but I find for me that when I'm dealing with blobs first, like I'm less stressed. I'm not spending all my time like like figuring out what a raccoon looks like. I'm just like, does he go here or does he go here? Is he bigger or is he smaller? You know, and that's a much faster, easier way to to get to uh, a good composition. All right, this is um, this is an artist named Michael Butkus. Uh, he's amazing poster artist in in Hollywood. Um, I don't know. I, I, this was grouped together. I was really just bringing up the one of Harry Potter. So sort of like what you're saying is there's different levels of, and different faces and all that kind of stuff. But we do, we, you, you do see what the main hierarchy is. It's Harry Potter is the most important thing. And then look at how the use of silhouettes and grouping these things together, like Hagrid's beard kind of goes into Harry Potter and, and uh, Ron Weasley's body kind of blends into that. And so he's kind of blending these things. Look at these little boats back here. Now there's a whole river of boats back there, but look at their value range. It's way lighter and mm -hmm. less contrast than what we're seeing in Harry Potter's face. And so you can do the same thing over and over. It doesn't matter what the illustration is, whether it starts getting a little pixelated at that stage, but even, even the shadows, like simplifying the shadow side of the owl um, is going to take away. You just can't have 50 things in an image and all of it have detail everywhere and lighting everywhere and value everywhere. I mean, look at the, this, this uh, castle back here is essentially a silhouette with just mm -hmm. little, little squares. There's no, no rendering or anything like yeah. that. So, so that's how you control that in that kind of situation. Same idea. Yeah. Very cool. Can I share the one from my class? Yeah. 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 Please. I'll just throw it up there really quick. 
So this is the image that I that I um, designed for that draw fifty things class. There's like 120 objects in here, but the mm -hmm. idea is to maintain a clear focal point, mm -hmm. a, a few, you know, secondary focal point, tertiary focal, you know. But like like how simple this is right here with this guy, this main character. And yet there's all this chaos behind him of, of objects and in, in front of him, all around him. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all about controlling it with value. Yeah. It's really yeah. good. And That's color. a nice one. So, I mean, that has so much detail in it, but it doesn't look busy. Yeah. It's, 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 it's exactly. Um, I posted something to the chat that for some reason, YouTube isn't allowing me to comment on this one. It just you won't. You can't post it on the YouTube it one? It just won't. When I hit enter, nothing happens. So I don't know. Oh, oh I'll I'll chat. copy and paste it. You, I, I yeah, was able to copy post the chat there. earlier. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Anya's oh, asking it's, about... it's actually in there right now. Okay. Well, maybe it did post. I don't see it. Oh no, no, it's not. Sorry. It's in, it's, it's stuck. In, it's in our chat, but it's yeah, not it's in, stuck. I don't see them in YouTube. There we go. Um, Anya's oh, asking, um you can only post two hundred words in a chat. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, so break it into two parts. Oh, okay. Here we go. So let me go ahead and get into her question. Um, she said, uh, this might've been talked about in other episodes, but do you worry that not creating illustrations partially or completely using AI will become the equivalent of digging out a pool with a spoon? Um, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I, I do see AI as being probably integrated in almost every artist's production in some capacity. Uh, in the future, it's just too easy, and there's no reason not to. Um, I don't know where that's going to land, to be honest. Dude, I'm well. Have you guys ever used autofill background or autofill in uh, all the time. Photoshop? Yeah, so that's that's AI right there. It's just looking at the rest of the image and like piecing it together. Right. Um, the, the the main so the technology for ai is i just like absolutely a godsend for me as an illustrator because the it, it saves me so much time there's some things where i just want to hand it over to a computer and say like blend these two images together and i'll work i'll work from that i'll take it uh, you know i'm making the creative decision of what two images to blend and then i'm taking the creative decision seeing what the computer has made and deciding what to keep and what to uh, uh, throw away or what to emphasize uh, and what, what needs to be downplayed. Um, the, the main issues with AI, the reason so many people are upset about it is, is that it's, uh, there's some unethical practices happening with it right now yeah. in that these things are developed using images they don't own uh, uh, and not there's no system in place to give credit to people whose images they've used. And there's also no like system in place to, um, to, to compensate or to like, what we would say like miss, uh, to, to prevent misuse or abuse or illegal activity using AI. Mm. I, the flip side of that though. So like one of the, one of the main problems is, is, like there's nothing stopping people from pasting, you know, Lee's face on, uh, you know, on a, some sort of like anti, um, whale picketing campaign type of thing. Right. Like right. actual video where Lee's like, I hate whales. I hate the whales. Let's kill the whales. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and so, you know, there's 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 ways for it to be abused. Now, someone did um, bring up another a, a good anti argument approach to regulation of AI, and Will, you might like this. Um, is if so? Right now, uh, Getty Images is suing, um, I believe, OpenAI. They're um, they're suing them for eight million dollars or or something like that wow. because. So many images that people have been creating with the software uh, um, have like fake Getty logos and, and watermarks on it. And it's very apparent that they're using Getty images 
to train the AI and, and whatnot. Mm. So they're suing them for essentially them using images they did, they 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 had no right to use, right? The fallout that could come from that was let's say um Disney, uh let's say what's another massive corporation um that that has a lot of that owns a lot of IP. Um uh um electronic arts ea right mm -hmm. one of these gaming companies let's say that they now um have legislation behind them and laws behind them that say we own that pose we own the color this particular shade of red and we have all this data backed up that says we created it and we have tools now to show that the image that you've made end up copying this particular pose that we always put, you know, Peter Pan in or, or Elsa or something like that. And so it's a way for large corporations to be able to have a, a, a more power to kind of go after anybody that can infringe on, on, uh, on their IP. So it's a, it's a fine line. It's a, there's a there's a needle that we're trying to thread here, but it doesn't mean we should just give up. I mean, there should be stuff put in place to make sure we're doing this the right way. Hmm. Um, he brought up the music industry. Like, um, what was it? Vanilla Ice lost a lawsuit for seven notes that he arranged in the same order as someone ding, else. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> ding, 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 so, ding. And because the music industry is very highly regulated, there's lots of money and lots of people, you know, making sure they're protecting their IP and the visual arts, photography, illustration industry isn't like that. And so you can copy a pose, you know, that doesn't mean the internet's going to point it out and say you're a pose copier, but they can't, you can't be, uh, you can't be sued because you put Spider-Man or you put your character in the same pose as Spider-Man, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. But it, that could happen. That could be something that could happen. It's such a, it's such a complex subject. There, there isn't uh, really easy answers. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny and then, because you see the arguments online and they, the every, you know, people love to try to reduce things down to yes or no, you know, like, thumbs up mm -hmm. thumbs down like it's like ai is bad ai is good yeah it's rare to, to hear people have a nuanced answer that that examines the pros and cons yeah right and, and it might Vanessa, come down to i mean what's that old there's like a, a quote from some supreme court justice from the 50s or 60s something like that and he's like he's like i can't define what pornography is but i know it when i see it because <laughs> mm. there's like something that reached the courts and whether it was you know it, you, you couldn't if you defined what it was then you're like eliminating half of you know uh right. you know paintings from the renaissance period right? right yeah tricky 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 right vanessa uh oh no lucas it's asks, tricky to rock around wow <laughs> what is your advice when freelance jobs are low and you have to say yes to bad projects to stay afloat? Should you just say no and wait for better jobs to land? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you guys, I know what it? I think is, yeah, live to fight another day, man. I mean, like, I took yeah. so yeah. many crappy projects starting out that I wouldn't take today, and I think it's irresponsible for veteran illustrators to say to young illustrators you should never fill in the blank or you should never take, you know, do this or that. Yeah. You should never sign a work for hire. Our work for hires. You should never not, work for exposure. Work for hire contracts are not favorable to artists. If, the, but if they're going to pay you a thousand dollars and that's the difference of you eating or paying your rent or not, why, why wouldn't you take it? You know? Right. I, I've had some young students ask me, like, am I ruining it, ruining the industry by taking a work for hire contract? No, you're not going to, someone's going to take that contract. If it's not you, they're going to offer it to someone else. Yeah. They're, you know, but and that might not be the key to you having a long career or, or a right. sustainable career. 
Yeah, you have to, you have may to, or may it not, has right? to be, it has to be limited. If it's just like a one-time thing, like, Hey man, I just need to get through this month, whatever. If you find that after two years, that's the only kind of work that you have. Mm -hmm. That's a different, that's a different kind of question, but I agree with Will is like, what are you going to do? Um, I also want to talk about the, the, for the record, I've probably signed somewhere between 30 and 50 work for hires in my career. That's How a lot. How much money did that come out to be? Um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I mean, like a lot of it was for textbook illustration work where it was just like, take it or leave it. And, yeah. um, and, and, and some of, some of those jobs were worth, you know, five, six, eight thousand mm dollars. -hmm. They were work for hires. I mean, times, and then some probably as low as 500 bucks and yeah, multiply that by I, 50, I, you know, I mean, like there's a lot of money there that was made that, that helped me feed my family. And I, I'm not apologetic for that at all. Um, I'm luckily I don't take those anymore. I haven't signed a work for hire in, I don't know how many years, you know, I did some work for Amazon that was, uh, not work for hire, but it was low pay. And uh, I was asked just, do I want to do these things? And the the budget was low, but the time I could do almost whatever I wanted to. And the time frames I could kind of pick and choose when I worked and when I didn't, they were short stories. Uh, and I just did them under a pen name and I developed a whole nother style for them mm. and banged them out. I mean, yeah. I developed a three color style mm. that was literally no, no gradients, just fills mm. and, banged them out and it was fine. And, and, and I actually enjoyed it. I actually learned quite a bit and working in that more simple style. I brought mm -hmm. some of that to my regular illustration. So I do want to share my screen just real quick, because I just gave this lecture last week to some students at SCAD. And this was one of my slides. Um, I'll just quickly go into it. Um, I don't think there's bad assignments anymore. I used to always have that needle. Like I get, a, I get an assignment, whether it's in school or from a client and it would say, Oh, that's assignment right up my alley. It's like Jake getting a a, a spaceship job. You know, yeah. of course, of course, you want that. Or somebody asked me to draw a cat in a hot air balloon. Like, okay, that's uh, we know that's going to be a good one. Um, and then if I was assigned something else, I'd be, oh, I don't want to do this. I'd be dragging my feet, and it always sucked. Mm -hmm. I, it was just such a dumb attitude, and I took that with me to my from school to my professional work. But by the time I was getting my MFA, I didn't have that idea anymore. Uh, and so we, uh, one of the standing assignments for my MFA was we were going to these different cities and we had to just do a reaction piece to the place we went. And one of the places we went was Dallas, Texas. And mm -hmm. for those of you guys who know me, I'm like, a, a, I grew up a skateboarder and a, and a, and when I moved to California, a surfer, I could not be more opposite of Western culture and rodeo. And specifically when we went to a rodeo and I'm like, ah, here we are. I don't, I do not identify with it. I, but then I was like, you know, screw it. I'm going to go ahead and go for it and try to make this subject matter my own. And I was able to play that. So I had just some different media stuff that I was playing with. And so that's the reason I made all, I didn't just make, well, I only had to make one image. I went ahead and made four mm. um, because I didn't want the assignment to beat me and to, and to, to dictate mm. how I felt about it. I brought myself to the assignment. And from that point on, man, everything changed because I know there is no subject matter you can give me that I can't make my own. And so if you start right. taking that, you can have ownership of your career in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, took me a long time to learn that. So I don't know if that's helpful for anybody, but that's, no, that's, that's, that's so important. Um, yeah. Often um, students think it's the assignment is the reason why they made bad art. And uh, it's just that they didn't own it. Like you said, like that's. Right. I, I'm also. You got to figure out a balance. I like the whole idea of one for you or one for them, one for you, uh, or, or maybe two for them, one for you, but work out in your schedule that you are going to do some work for yourself and, mm -hmm. and, and make some real good portfolio pieces that is the type of work you want to be getting, mm -hmm. you want to be doing. Cause like, I mean, this is something that, that even like high budget, uh, a you know five star a type personality hollywood directors have to do <laughs> like christopher yeah. nolan has to slum it in the batman universe for three films <laughs> in order for him to make his dunkirk you know <laughs> and so uh uh and so you're no better than them so uh you take take the job for hire take the take the take the gig that pays you um and and there's nothing wrong with that but then 
you know, maybe you use that project to fund something you really want to work on that could lead to more of what, what you want to do. I, Let me add I one more little. I can't find the book, but I did this. I want to go back to work for hire real quick. I, I did this book that um, it was a little reading book for a publisher and it was work for hire. And after I did it, I was like, you know, I was really young as an illustrator. I was in my probably like late twenties. And uh, I started thinking, I started realizing what the contract was saying, like the contract work for hire says that the client created the work you didn't. Right. Basically yeah. the language is, is yeah. like, like it's ours. We made this thing mm -hmm. right? and you were, you you're were just our tool. You're, you're our tool. You're, right. Yeah. They're you're and the I, same as, I, as us using a, a hammer. Right. And I started thinking about it and I'm like, so if they sell a million copies of this book, I'm going to, that's going to kill me because you know, right. I'm not getting any royalties on it. So what I did was I made sure that, that of the pro the projects that I uh, signed work for hires for were not books. They were not complete products anymore. They were a piece of a product mm -hmm. that way. I, w if it did well, I wouldn't even know. I don't know how many textbooks they sell. That's not like something that you see in a bookstore or something. I just didn't want to see a book that I made right selling everywhere and I'm not getting anything from it right. at all. So I never did another one of those. I never did a book. It was always like a piece yeah. for this or that. Well, that's what I was going to add to the end of that is like, you know, if you are saying yes to a quote unquote bad job, low paying job or a job that has unfavorable terms, think about the time frame. If it's for a magazine and it's three illustrations, that's not going to kill you going to give you a nice little bump in income and you can do it right. if it's a year-long project that's like five books long you you know weigh that very carefully i that was the first job i was ever offered out of mm -hmm. school a five book deal uh i can't remember what the total amount was but for me then that the money was pretty good but the time frame they wanted a like a, basically a year and a half of my time and then with the way that all the books were paced out in the page numbers, I realized I'd have to create a finished illustration every single day of the year with no days off right? in order to do it. And that when I pointed that out, I was like, yeah, I, it, I'd rather just do something else. I'd rather drive for Uber or whatever and work my way into illustration the correct way, than kill myself, have no portfolio pieces for it because I'm just you know, just basically handing them illustrations as fast as I can do them. Um, mm -hmm. That just doesn't seem like a good way. So I'd rather, I'd rather work a different job and keep illustration on the slow burn than do something that's going to kill you for a long-term kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But by the way, I want everyone to know that Jake and Lee would also sign the work for hire tomorrow if the pay yeah. were right. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's true. If it was a million dollars, bring it. So I'll sign it. Right. So don't feel bad for signing one if it works for you in your life. And define work for hire it, just for people listening this whole time and thinking, what, what exactly is it's that? It's basically a no royalty deal. Mm -hmm. It's it's you don't own the rights. A lot of them are really overreaching. The lawyers that write these things just go nuts and, and uh, they'll say, well, you can't even post. It's not yours anymore. You can't even put it on your website. Right. And stuff like that. Number one, no client is going to go after an artist for sharing the work that they did on their website. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they put that in there. It's so stupid. Most mm -hmm. of the time they could get away with all rights for a specific amount of time. Right. It, would, it would be fine for the client. Right. And that's how I battle. That's how I argue against a work for hire contract is if they ask for that, I say, well, why do you need that contract? What right. about this? What if you've and totally forgotten about the art? But it means something to me, and I want to sell it in another form later on. But what you're saying is buy buy the rights for a specific time that expires, mm -hmm. right? With, where they can renew it. If the product is still selling in five or ten years, then renew your contract with me. You're making good money. Right? Yeah, you're protected either way. Yeah. And if and if it's not, then let me have it back. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on. Yeah. We killed that one. We and actually, let's. We're down to a couple more questions, and then we should probably call it good for today. Okay. Uh, um, where are we at? We're at, we're at, we just answered Vanessa's. Um, so it's we're down to Luca. Oh, so there's only one. Wait, is there one more? Um, oh, oh Vanessa's asking, asking. 
Would you ever consider creating an illustration as a master study of each other's work? For example, I create something in Jake's style. We talk about that all the time, making fun of each other because how predictable we all are. I could do your style better than you, Lee. I could do your style sometimes <laughs> better than you. <laughs> <laughs> we should i mean yeah that would be fun to jake to is a star, J- <laughs> you can do jake's jake is jake is a robot we, I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm a, a cat in a hot air balloon and will is just a woodland creature pushing a wheel, <laughs> wheelbarrow full of berries like if yeah. you just draw those three things you'll have each of us down <laughs> yeah um just want to lucas gave us a, a a thank you for the advice we gave last time about choosing a path and creating a universe uh that he can just jump around in subject matter so i'm i'm glad uh i'm glad that worked for him Good. uh another question from lucas how did you all balance having small children in the house while staying productive as an artist um yeah so for for me i leaned I mean, it was very much leaning on my wife. Like there was a division of of labor and boundaries were set. And there were certain times that I was going to be available and certain times where I was going to have to work. And and we understood, we understood that. And so I think you just have to have a good, you know, a, a good conversation uh with your with your partner mm-hmm. about who's going to have the kid when and so that the other person can get the work, the work done that they need to get done. And there was times where I was like, okay, I've got the kids now. And she was able to do what she needed to do. You know, Um, I I was going to say, you you know, Jed Henry, our Mm -hmm. friend of ours, um, he, for, I want to say four or five years was a stay at home dad. And he, his wife worked, because she had more earning potential than he did. And so he took care of kids, made the lunches, got them out to school. Um, while he worked on his portfolio and was able to start getting the jobs that actually would equal or be more than the work that she was doing. Sometimes you have to go that route. Hmm. I want to talk a little bit about this. Is I'm going to, I got to be careful here because of the way that I say it. It's, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, the 50, I'll, I'll preface it with this. The 50s were a horrible time for many, many reasons. Um, but I heard an interesting take on the 50s versus now. Now, in the 50s, there was a clear division of labor in the household, and it was, and it leaned towards a sexist kind of slant. The, the man always earns the money and, and the wife is at home. Now, I'm not saying that needs to be the power dynamic. That could be, like Jake was saying, it could be um switched around and, and that's totally fine. The women are anymore. But my point is, or, or what this what this thing that I was listening to was talking about was back then, one person was at home and they were responsible for all the home stuff. And then one person was at work and they were responsible for all the work stuff. And so that created a certain kind of balance that now, uh, this was a, a, a talking about productivity and, and feeling overwhelmed and trying to sort of, we, we now have the belief system that you can have kids, two parents both work. And then you're also somehow supposed to get the laundry done and cook and clean and have a nice house and, and then still have time for fun. And it, <laughs> they were saying, there's just, you, you can't do all that. And in the past, they didn't do all that. There was a split where somebody said, you do the house stuff, I'll do the work stuff. And we could still do that now. But now for some reason, people think that they can take on all of it and have a balanced life. And they were saying that is impossible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so it was just an interesting, interesting take about that, about, you know, dividing up how Mm -hmm. much you work, how much you spend at home. And so what I've done based on that specific thing that I heard, have decided to start putting like one hour more in my normal workday, Monday through Thursday. And I'm taking Fridays off now to do, that's just my housework, take the car to the mechanic, do the running around, do the laundry. And then I've got the weekend to try to try to achieve some of that balance again, because you can't work a full-time job and then have... Uh, an organized life outside of that too, if both people are working. Mm-hmm. Right. And I also, uh, to add to that, I think you, when you're starting out, it's okay to let your life go out of balance. You know, like, right. like yeah. my, my, there were many times where if my, if you life don't have was, kids, right. Well, even with, ki- with kids, like my wife went to teach school and I took care of the kids when they come home from school and I had a little toddler at home 
Mm -hmm. that sometimes I couldn't get work done and we'd just arrange it so that I'd start working sometimes when she got home and I'd work well, well into the night and our lives were topsy turvy sometimes and out of balance, but it worked, you know, I mean, we, we had to make it work. Mm -hmm. You do what you have to do. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a photo my wife took of me one time. I was, had a deadline. I was working on a comic, had to get it finished. And I was also in charge of the baby at the time. And so there's an image of me rocking him in my arms as I'm at the desk, like drawing. <laughs> like, I've done that. I had a bassinet <laughs> that I could rock with my foot Yeah, and paint. So mm -hmm. I try to get my drawings done because drawing was um, harder to do with rocking. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'd get him to sleep under my desk and then I'd just work as hard as I could. And if he started waking up, I'd rock him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get good at working in little spurts of of, yeah. of power kind of drawing and then you got to take yeah. care of the kid and in 2013 my son was three years old and i just remember that specific year because that year i had a three-year-old i was working as a full-time teacher at the art institute of portland i was getting my mfa and i did four children's books <laughs> that year it was i can't imagine That's i don't need when i look back on it i don't understand how i did it it's I know. like because our lives were more out of balance then and that's you know, you have more bandwidth for that when you're young, mm -hmm. I think. I don't anymore um, have bandwidth to work as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness, because uh, I don't have to. But I'd say, yeah, you you got to make hay while the sun rises. Like yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. There, there was a question here from Charlotte that we missed. How do you find those easy job, easy jobs for the first easy jobs for illustration work? Um, I recommend, I've always recommended magazines. Um, you, you need, if you look at it from the client's point of view, what's a low risk place that they can hire an illustrator that and textbook, that's new? Textbook uh, illustration hires a lot of beginning illustrators. Um, yeah. We could spend a whole podcast on the finding. Maybe we should do one on that. But go for the, go for those easy ones because like for a magazine, uh, uh, publisher to hire you like cricket or highlights or something like that it doesn't cost them anything like they you know you might be doing one or two illustrations and if you totally bombed on it doesn't wreck their magazine or anything like mm -hmm. that whereas trying to get a children's book well that's a lot of money invested in one person for one product mm -hmm. um, so the magazines is 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 my route yeah like route. that that's a, actually you reverse engineer look around if you see an illustration anywhere figure out how that, who, the, who made that illustration and how they got hired to do that job. Mm -hmm. Who um, the publisher was. And yeah, that, and the finding is constantly changing how you find these. What worked for us way back when probably doesn't work today, mm -hmm. but we have the internet today too. And finding out information, the hardest part I think is, is the whole concept of moving without the ball in basketball. Mm -hmm. It's tough to drive through a lane, not knowing if you're going to get past the ball. Mm -hmm. so you're running, you're doing this effort and it might be for nothing. And um, the same goes true when you're trying to prospect in illustration. You're sitting there going, well, I could be doing these fun things or I could be doing this thing that might not bear any fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's what paralyzes most people. The people that get work are the ones who push through that paralyzation. Yeah. And and spend a lot of time researching and finding clients that hire illustrators. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually we gotta wrap it up. Can we take Charlie's real quick? Just really quick. If it's the, if it's the quick. Low, really quick. Okay. Hey, hi, Charlie. We she's been with us for a long time. I know we gotta take Charlie's, and um, you have an answer for it too. Well, so. yeah, she's talking about low content books. I don't, I don't get it on, on Amazon. So there's like all these videos all over YouTube. Here's how you make a ton, you know, $10,000 a month with low content books. And when you dig into it, yeah, they're notebook books and journals with like your own design on the front. So really, you know, they're like, they're like have all these ways of like trying to find something that hasn't been put on Amazon that'll appeal to people like put like get a stock photo of a lion mm -hmm. and, and have it printed on you know, make a con low content book of just basically there's nothing in it. It's just paper for people to, you know, like a, a, a sketchbook or a notebook or something. And then you sell them. Yeah. Um, I don't know 
much about them other than that's what they are. And that's how people are trying to compete is by doing nothing, getting something for doing nothing. Mm-hmm. And I think that in like, could you possibly get the right image on a low content book to sell a lot? Yeah. But I wonder how many people have done that and not gotten anything out of it or, at all. Mm-hmm. Anthony I Wheeler, I'm gonna we're time. gonna argue argue with Will on this one. Anthony oh, yeah? Wheeler's making a ton well, on his sketchbook. But that's well, that's but, different. Why? He, he he he's taking his audience to that book. Um, but I, I think she, what, asked, she didn't say like uh, what you well, know. But what I know what she's if you thinking. Have no audience. Lee, I know what she's thinking. But she could have an audience. You got, I mean, we're, we're all talking about building an audience, but you have stuff available for that audience. Yeah. I argue with these guys because I sell, I mean, I, I don't know if a, if a greeting card would count in this little thing because there's no content. It's just an image with a no, blank inside. The greeting card is the content. This well, is a blank but, book. But I no, agree. But so, Look, so, is a, so is a journal. Or, if Anthony's or, or making kind of good money, it's because he's sending his audience there. And in that case, I think it's great. Yeah. I, and I also think he's getting repeat buyers because it's such a quality product. I don't know about the quality of the KDP, you know, the Kindle Direct like sketchbooks, like what paper are they using? Right. Oh, I, I didn't know what key, KDP is. Is that what that stands for? It's Kindle Direct. Yeah. So it's basically like they print on demand your book, kind of like the book that I have on there right now. Yeah, I mean, you always have to manage the quality control. And so yeah. that is number one for sure. But but in terms of like, let's get rid of the KDP part of that question. I, then I agree ask, with you. Yeah, it, and if you're just putting out a high quality sketchbook, high quality journal or something like that, I mean, I don't see any reason not to do that. I'm doing that right now. I'm making a, because I, I talked to Anthony and I'm like, dude, give me that printer. And he's like, I'm not giving you the printer's name. I found him. <laughs> he doesn't want to <laughs> give up his market share. But if I can put an image on the front of 50 blank pages and somebody gets value out of that, they like it and I mm-hmm. like giving it to them, why wouldn't I want that exchange? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. All well, right. Should we wrap it up? Sorry if we missed a question here or there. We are doing our, our Q&A episode in two weeks, I think, or next week. So mm-hmm. just keep an eye out on Patreon. And put it in there, and we'll answer it in our in our Q and A episode. That's not it's not live. Also, but, notice that we're a little slow to get started. So, if you get your question, if like you throughout the week, if you think of one, write it down. Yeah, write it down, and, and then we, you can be we'll, one of the first ones. We'll be doing this. We do these live first or second week every month, depending on it, um, on on the schedule. So yeah, hey, so, just yeah. for house cleaning too. Before we go. Mm-hmm. I know some of you guys are subscribers. Some of you probably aren't, but whatever. If you are interested in that portfolio review, mm-hmm. I'm just going to say this. Most of our teachers have only signed on for a, an extremely small number of reviews. And so that's going to go live on March 1st. If you're interested in that, do not think that they will be available after that first day. Well, they want to see how it goes. So I think right now in the beginning rounds, they just kind of want to do a few. Yeah. And right, right, right. They they may ramp up as we as we go, but they're only doing a, just a couple. And so I just want to put that out there. That's not going to be like, oh, it's just you know, just wait around for it. If you're interested in that thing, jump on it quick because it is. I mean, it might even be just like each teacher is only going to take two students. I mean, it's going to be that small. But the so, reason for that is these are like premium portfolio reviews. You're you're going to be paying for deep, it, but it's dive. also, um, it's you're going to be getting. They're from people who are person. busy doing work. Yeah, these right. are pros. This is uh, total yeah. pros. And they, uh, yeah, it's a deep dive. So just wanted to throw that out there because I don't want people to see it launch and then the next day be like, everything's booked. I'm warning you, that is what's going to happen. Right. So I'm going to do the outro. I'm then going to end the live stream, but you two stay on our uh, Zoom meeting here so we can talk for a minute. Okay. Sound good? All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by you, the patrons, uh, and svslearn.com. But this episode in particular, by you, the patrons, we thank you for signing up and and joining us there Uh, and for all the benefits that you're getting. um, Hopefully, it's it's definitely worth worth, uh, your hard-earned cash. Your hosts today have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. You guys know where to find us. Um, and I think that's it. We'll say special thanks to Daniel too, for really keeping this, uh, Patreon engine running, uh, while we do our, our work, uh, special thanks to, uh, our keeper of the curriculum, 
Austin Shirtliff, who helped organize all of our SVS uh, foundations, got that in a, in a great spot so you guys could use it to improve your portfolios. Special thanks to our show notes wrangler, Lily Howell. She does awesome work. Every time you go to one of these episodes and you want to find a link of something we talked about or or you know, dive, dive in a little bit deeper, she's the one who's handling that for us. So we're thankful for that. And our chief operations officer, Lisa Fott, who really keeps the lights on because she pays the bills for us. So um, literally, that is it for us today. Now go draw something. <laughs>